Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jen and Simon. Thanks so much for putting together these ideas uh, for us so clearly uh, and taking the time to be with us today. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Uh, hi, Jen, and we'll welcome back Simon as well. Um, so, hi, Simon. Uh, so, I was, Jen, I was struck by a few things in, the, in your presentation. It was helpful to have a solid overview of what direct air capture is, some of the energy inputs that might be necessary, and a, a bit more, a bit about where we might consider storage. And Simon, it was helpful to hear the ways in which we can or should start thinking about steering the direct air capture towards good outcomes uh, and a few aspects of setting the right enabling environment for direct air capture development. Uh, for our participants, I just want to remind people they can put questions in the Q&A box uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll address those as they come in. Uh, Simon and Jen, I want to start with a just grounding question. What's the state of research? Uh, where, where is research happening? How is research happening? How much research is happening? Uh, maybe Jen, we'll start with you. Sure, happy to answer that. Uh, so today, direct air capture and projects are on a very small scale compared to what we need. Uh, so the leading companies are really a company, Climeworks, has a commercial technology and um, lots of projects globally, uh, but all adding up to on the order of thousands of tons of removal per year. Uh, an example project is in Iceland, which is the CO2 that's captured from the atmosphere is mineralized in basalt formations, and so it truly is carbon removal. Uh, because there's not a big price on putting carbon back in the earth today, though, a lot of their projects are actually looking at CO2 conversion, so to fuels, and maybe they're using it for food and beverage or for greenhouses, um, only because they need to find a market for the CO2, and it's, and it's kind of keeping uh, the direct air capture on a very small scale today. Uh, the other company that's pretty, you know, pretty far ahead um, is Carbon Engineering, and they have a project uh, that's expected to launch, I think, in 2023, with a, a single plant that will remove on the order of 1 million tons of CO2 per year. Uh, but those are two very different technologies, and I wouldn't exactly call them, they're not at the research stage. Uh, the, they're pretty much commercially developed uh, technologies, but they're still expensive today. And so there is the concept of building more, learning from building, learning from doing, in order to move down the cost curve. And, uh, but aside from those kind of leading technologies that are expensive today, or at least viewed, viewed as that, um, there are also technologies that are not as far along, uh, that are at more of a research stage, um, that could be even more efficient and elegant if it works out. Like, so these are technologies that are 100% associated with electrochemistry, so electricity really being the sole um, type of energy going to the system. These are called electro swing, or in some cases, electrochemical, um, where the climb works and the carbon engineering are very thermally dominated in terms of energy resources today. And so just really different technologies. And um, the two that I mentioned, the climb works and carbon engineering are really far along compared to some of the others. There's also one more uh, that you know, often is appearing in the headlines as well as is global thermostat. And so I think they're probably somewhere in between. I don't think that they have a, a full project launch yet, but it, it feels like something's coming soon. So that could be exciting. Uh, but that's, that's where things are at today is really on the thousands of tons of removal. So we really need to get to that next scale of millions of tons. Okay. Um, and uh, can you just give us, for the audience, many of the audience members will already have this sense, but for those that don't, uh, on the scale, right now we're moving thousands of tons, potentially millions of tons, but can you give us a sense of what that is, megatons versus gigatons, uh, and the kind of removal, removals we need to see by the mid-century and end of century? Yeah, so the idea, you know, by mid-century, in the Academy of Sciences report that I referenced in, in my talk, um, we estimated that on the order of 10 gigatons of CO2 to removal per year up to mid-century and 20 gigatons after that per year up to 2100. But what we also showed is that we have the technical potential to do 10 gigatons of CO2 removal today for under $100 per ton 
using technologies that don't have to do with direct air capture because they don't cost $100 a ton today. And right. so the technologies that we outlined, and there's a nice summary table at the beginning of that report, um, are things like bioenergy coupled to carbon capture and storage. Um, using waste biomass, though, as a feedstock for that. So you have to be able to think about and quantify how much waste biomass is there and what's the potential of using that as a feedstock. Um, improved afforestation, reforestation, and forest management tech, you know, um, approaches. Um, and then, and then so, so a lot in soil carbon storage, blue carbon. So all of those are more, you know, are termed kind of nature-based solutions to carbon removal. Um, they, you know, the costs associated with doing those are just lower today than they are for the more technical approaches like mineralization of CO2 or accelerated weathering or direct air capture. But the whole point of that, really a, a large driving force of that report was to establish a research agenda for the space. And so the idea with that is, is that we recognize that direct air capture, mineralization, these might be expensive technologies today or they're in a lower technological readiness level. Um, but if we deploy them today and we increase the scale today because we can, because the technologies exist, like the carbon engineering and the climates, they exist. So if we advance the deployment today, then by mid-century, they could get down to $100 per ton. And then at that point, after mid-century, play a larger role in making up the needs of 20 gigatons versus the 10 gigatons per year today. So the idea was that, is that, but we, but direct air capture won't be ready for a gigaton by mid-century if we don't deploy today, you know, at least, you know, a, a thousand times. At some point we need to get to the millions of tons before we get to the gigaton. So, so that's kind of the idea there. Okay, so that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> I wanna ask a kind of another context setting question, maybe just background question, then we'll move, we're starting to get some questions from the audience. Um, and this question has a couple of parts to it, but at the moment, uh, it seems like the conversation around direct air capture and how to govern it, uh, kind of in the sense, the steering sense, Simon, that you were outlining, uh, seems like it, it's a bit hobbled uh, by the actual or perceived relationships between direct air capture, traditional CCS, and EOR. So maybe you all can, the two of you can help us untangle that a bit. Um, you both mentioned that uh, carbon capture by direct air capture is currently some of its use for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, maybe we can hear from both of you the arguments for going that route and the, maybe the arguments against going that route. Um, and then also breaking down the relationship between traditional CCS, which is attached to power plants and direct air capture. Are there policy pathways that tie them together and policy pathways that could potentially separate them? Um, so there's a lot there, but maybe Simon, we'll start with you. Thanks, Michael. Well, there are certainly technical pathways which tie carbon capture and storage to direct air capture. Um, because, of course, if you want negative emissions, that is, if you want to draw down atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and then potentially other greenhouse gases down the road, one needs to find pathways to long-term geologic storage um, or putting carbon dioxide potentially into long lived products, right? Uh, and so the, the carbon storage component of carbon removal with carbon storage is absolutely essential to its operating as a negative emissions response option. Um, now, this is where things start to get murky because often in media um, uh, conversations about carbon removal, there's a conflation between removing carbon from the atmosphere and putting it into something and the idea of negative emissions. Those two things are not necessarily equal. If carbon is being removed from the atmosphere and put into something like a fuel, we might end up with a low carbon fuel, but we're not necessarily um, getting negative emissions, right? And so just, just kind of sorting through those, um, those kind of nuanced aspects of these different approaches and how they link together is critical. And that then leads to the policy conversation which Jen flagged in the, in the great video that she put together. When we're thinking about the role of oil companies, um, fossil fuel companies in this whole endeavor, this is really kind of treacherous territory, to be honest. It would be one thing if oil companies were good, honest brokers who could be trusted when it comes to climate action. But we know that they can't. We know through the, the, the long and bloody history that oil companies cannot be trusted when it comes to climate change. Uh, and so there's a, there's a dance being done at the moment between the environmental community, which is really interested in exploring whether direct air capture with carbon removal with, uh, might, might offer something, 
in terms of climate response and the need potentially for oil companies to be involved in that endeavor because they have the, the technical know-how and capacity to do some of the work that needs to be done, not just on exploration, but potentially um, utilization of these approaches. Right, that's a, that's a really interesting balancing relationship at the moment. Um, there's, a, there's a danger that if <clears throat> all of the power is given to the oil and gas companies, we end up in a bad place. And so that's a, that should be a starting point to thinking about how to work through that relationship. But honestly, Jen, I don't have an answer um, to exactly how the environmental community and the oil and gas interests can or should come together around these questions. I know that's something you've been thinking about. Yeah, it's hard. This is not, uh, this is, the, you know, this is, this is the hard part of the equation. And I think the hard part is, is that the, it's the history that we have, you know, the oil and gas history. You know, they, they've been using CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. The first project was done in 1972 in the Permian Basin. And if we think about, you know, this, this decades of, of history and experience that that community has, and you ask, has there ever been an accident? Has the CO2 ever leaked? And the answer is no. And, and part of the reason for that is because the same mechanisms that are going to store CO2 are the ones that have been storing oil and gas for millions of years. And in fact, it was, you know, by accident, really, that this all kind of happened in, in that in the late 60s, you know, I think it was BP, was looking for gas and tapped into a dome and found high purity CO2. And there was academic work going on in the late 60s of CO2 being used as a surfactant um, in, the, in, the, in decaffeination and all kinds of different applications um, for CO2 in its super critical form. And, uh, and, and so these two things kind of came together. There was a natural CO2 source that came out of this dome and, uh, and then acknowledging from really the academic and scientific community that CO2 could be used as an enhancement to bring, to change the, the properties of the oil. You know, after increasing pressure with water flooding, how do you get more oil out? You can change the density, the viscosity, the surface tension. And so CO2 could be used in that way. And that's when those projects first began is in the early seventies. And so today, most of that CO2, as I mentioned, is, is naturally sourced from the earth. And so it's just moved from these natural CO2 sources in the earth over to where the oil is. Like you can kind of think about it in that way because the CO2, that CO2 that's used for EOR today doesn't escape back into the atmosphere. The CO2 that ends up in the atmosphere is what we get when we refine the crude oil, is what we get when we burn the oil in an internal combustion engine. That's the carbon, right? And so to me, it's like, I absolutely think that if we really want to do direct air capture in a responsible way, if we really want to do carbon capture for the really difficult um, to abate sectors like steel production, cement production, where it makes sense to do carbon capture, that we should not tie it to enhanced oil recovery, that we should find other approaches like dedicated CO2 storage which to me is like, that's exactly why 45Q and the economic, the, the gap between utilization for EOR and dedicated storage needs to be larger. And, and as I mentioned in my presentation, um, Petronova, you know, if it wasn't, it, it, you know, in that case, because the CO2 that was captured from a power plant is used to enhance oil recovery, when the price of oil went down too low, that was no longer economic, it was expensive to use anthropogenic CO2. And it was just much, much cheaper to use the natural stuff that's in the earth that they've been using for decades. And so I, I think if we really want to see this approach move forward and we need it to, it needs to be part of the solution, uh, then we need to be able to have the governance uh, that responsibly um, steers it, you know, towards other types of projects. And, and I saw in one of the questions that's related, you know, what are the niche applications, you know, and, and how do we get those to scale? And that's the issue is that 80 million tons of CO2 is used in the United States every year, but 72 of that is EOR. Hmm. And so what else do we have that scales? If you look at the different technologies, Climeworks, it's a very modular based approach and it works on, you know, each project is like a thousand tons of CO2, but well, that's, that's pretty small. It's great for kind of getting started, um, but the difference with carbon engineering is they work on economies of scale 
And so they need to couple to something that's 750,000 tons per year or a million tons per year. So it's kind of like, what are their options? You know, what are they going to couple to? What are they going to use that CO2 for if there's not the economic um, potential to just dedicatedly, you know, store it underground? And so I would just add back to what Simon had mentioned is, you know, in concrete. So concrete is something that also scales to gigatons. And there are companies today that are doing the different approaches. There's a company called Savante, right? And, and that's a company that does carbon capture at the exhaust of the cement kiln. And they're already working in partnerships with Lafarge Holson, which is one of the very large cement producers globally. And so they're looking at carbon capture. And just, just to be very careful with the language, that's avoiding carbon emissions into the atmosphere. But if you look at concrete, to make concrete, you need cement which is the dominant part of the carbon footprint of the concrete. You need water and you need sand and gravel. And so there are other companies that are actually making synthetic sand and gravel. So rather than mining it, you can actually take alkalinity from the earth, not that different from what I talked about in my talk with the accelerated weathering. You can take alkalinity from the earth and react it with CO2 from the atmosphere. And now that becomes removable and you're putting it into the synthetic aggregate that can be used to replace gravel for concrete. So you're coupling the two. So you're avoiding the carbon emissions from making cement by doing carbon capture, but you're also storing the carbon in the synthetic gravel that you're using to make the concrete. And in this way, we turn an industry today that's a really difficult to abate sector into one that actually could be negative. But the, the issue is, is like all these companies, they're not working together today. They're kind of each working in a vacuum. And I argue that it's not about trade-offs. You can actually do in single projects and opportunities, carbon capture and carbon removal to have maximum benefit. And so I, I think there are, and I don't, I wouldn't call them niche applications because gigatons to me is exciting. That's an interesting scale. And that's the concrete scale today is tens of gigatons every year. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and, and maybe we can, uh, all of the, the fantastic kind of exciting options you just laid out, maybe we can talk about some of the incentives or kind of policy pathways uh, that might uh, take us in that direction. So James asks, uh, given the energy differential for direct air capture as compared with other methods of carbon removal applied energy costs, do you see direct air capture playing a significant role in the long term? And then he asks, what sort of incentives would be needed for this is it you know, possible to ever put this on parity with fossil fuels? Um, so Simon, maybe you want to take the first swing there, uh, and then we can, Jen can, can also think about that. Yeah, so, so one, one way to think about direct air capture is that it offers a backstop option um, in, in two ways, right? So the, the, the cost of direct air capture at scale tied to um, long-term storage will tell us whether it makes sense to do direct air capture or other forms of carbon removal or potentially forms of emissions abatement if we want to put all of those together alongside one another. Um, and so will direct air capture ever play a gigantic role where there are some technical questions that need to be answered, there are some economic questions, but also a whole bunch of social questions and environmental questions about what this kind of enterprise looks like at the types of scale that, that um, Jen is speaking about. Um, just um, just to just to put a sharp point on something that Jen mentioned, when we're talking about 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide being removed from the atmosphere by mid-century, scaling up to 20 gigatons of carbon removal, that's a truly gigantic enterprise, given, as Jen mentioned, that all of human emissions at the moment are about 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, about 50 if you count um, non-CO2 gases and, and greenhouse carbon equivalent. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely extraordinary thing to imagine, and direct air capture alone could never do it, could almost certainly never be fully responsible for all of that um, recaptured carbon. We have to think of a portfolio of response options that somehow work together in a strategic fashion um, with direct air capture providing the backstop price given um, its mechanical uh, operation that we could kind of understand the economics of it, and given the large potential storage opportunities that, that we know exist. Um, did you want to jump in there, Jen, and then I can say a word or two about potentially um, the, the policy aspect of the question? Yeah, um, I mean, I'll just say 
and I, and I say this often, is that it will never be cheaper to take carbon back out of the atmosphere using chemical engineering um, than it would be to just simply avoid it in the first place. And so and this goes back to, it's related to a siting question, but also, you know, to, when you start to scale up, you have to ask yourself, where's the energy coming from? And you have to make a decision what type of energy you want to couple to it. And so some of the work that we do, I like to look at, well, where's all the fossil today? Because first and foremost, we need to understand how we're going to, you know, uh, replace the fossil-based, you know, electricity generation with renewables. And so if you're thinking about siting direct air capture and you have access to low carbon electricity or energy through the form of renewables, be very careful how you decide to spend those low carbon renewables. If there's a coal fired power plant nearby and could retire within a decade, first and foremost, that should be replaced and that should be the priority. And so I, I think that it's really important to, to just, you know, the whole siting of direct air capture and this concept that it could be placed anywhere is really um, dangerous. And, um, and so I think that that's, that's really important. And then tangentially related, and I don't know if, if, if it was James, the, the person who asked this question, if this is what they were referring to also, but something that often gets ignored is that we think that you know, and again, I'm a chemical engineer by training, so I can't help but get excited about these kinds of projects, is that we think that the transportation sector is so difficult to avoid and that's so difficult, you know, with the, the you know, shipping and, um, and also in, in airplanes and, you know, these in decarbonizing these types of, you know, sectors. And, but it's like, we, we have known from a chemical engineering perspective how to make synthetically chemicals, and fuels again for decades. And we typically will make them through synthesis gas, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. But in fact, there absolutely you can take CO2 from the atmosphere and green hydrogen and combine them to make these types of fuels. It's just, again, it's expensive today. And guess what? The part that's expensive isn't direct air capture. It's green hydrogen. It's the capital expense associated with electrolysis. That's expensive today. And so it's, again, I think it's really important to kind of think holistically about the solutions and, and understand, you know, that that also will help us to decouple from fossil fuels, right? And we know that synthetic aviation fuels or biofuels are not going to be a silver bullet solution either. And so synthetic fuels to me is, is a space that's quite interesting. And as Simon mentioned, no, it's not carbon removal you know, at best neutral because you're pulling that CO2 from the air, you're turning to fuel and you're only putting it back when you put it in your internal combustion engine. But this is an effort that like Climeworks is very enthusiastic and they're already working with a company called Sunfire and they're already working with the airport that's interested in, in, in selling that fuel in Europe. And, and I think that's a very interesting and excited space. And Ultimately, I wouldn't say it directly compare or competes with fossil fuels, but what it does is it gives us a pathway to not relying on them. And I think that's important. Simon, did you, uh, you mentioned you want to follow up some, with some thoughts on the policy aspect of the question. Uh, well, I, I wonder if there's anything to say that's not kind of obvious based on the conversation to date. I mean, that the sorts of incentives that are necessary to really move direct air capture forward are you know, get tax incentives or direct payments to companies to do the investigative work. Um, and that great report that Jen was uh, an author on, the National Academy study, in the US context lays out a government-run set of pathways to investigation of direct air capture in relation and alongside a whole bunch of other carbon removal approaches. Right? And so the, the, the kind of scale-up policy pathways that have been pretty well sketched to this point, um, you know, by, by folks at Columbia in the United States and, and various other people who have been thinking carefully about what's required. Um, we have the architecture at least mapped out. Um, the, the work now is the political and social work of getting buy-in for investigative work and at the same time building the architecture for the potential scale-up of direct air capture down the road. Uh, we have a question about citing considerations touching on some things that you all have both mentioned from Courtney, she asked, can you speak more about citing considerations for direct air capture, possibly uh, possible con competition with renewable energy, adverse effects of living near a facility, uh, 
uh, protecting biodiversity and resources, upholding environmental justice. So a lot of things to consider. Uh, and she's asking, is there anything additional to consider as well? Simon, why don't we start with you? Uh, sure, this is, this is more a Jen question. I, I, I would defer to her for some of the technical aspects of siting, um, but just to pick on some of the social aspects here. Um, these, these could potentially be gigantic facilities. And whenever we're talking about a gigantic mechanical facility, then there are going to be questions that local communities have about the siting of that enterprise. And so getting out early and thinking about engagement with communities in which these different facilities might be sited, um, having not just one-way flow of inf information from companies saying, hey, this is a good idea, it might create jobs, let us do this, to real public conversation and public deliberative work um, is an essential front-end uh, component of what needs to happen here. Um, and people are going to have concerns about having something taken from the atmosphere and injected under their feet. Now, whether or not those concerns are valid in a technical sense doesn't get away from the fact that people are going to have those concerns. And so again, the, the, the need for public deliberation is very clear here. Uh, but Jen, on the, on the technical side of siting, you'll have much more to say. Okay, um, I, can, I can mention a little bit. I mean, in the Lawrence Livermore study, the one that they led on um, the path to neutrality for the state of California by 2045, um, chapter five focused on direct air capture and in my group, we, we um, authored that and we looked specifically at opportunities where there's existing energy infrastructure that could be coupled to direct air capture. So that is a siting consideration. Again, if we're only at thousands at best of removal today, then we need lots of thousands, you know? And so what we outlined there were uh, lots of opportunities in the state of California where one could do one of two things. You could use in the Salton Sea, for instance, which is the Southern part of the state, there's a lot of geothermal potential uh, that is not necessarily high enough quality for electricity generation and there's not enough of a population density there such that you would need it for heating office buildings and homes and things like that or swimming pools which is often what the low-grade geothermal is used for and so we thought well that's you know untapped opportunity and so we looked at that and to see what the potential is because it turns out again um, not all direct air capture technologies are created equal and so the Climeworks types and the global thermostat types, which are based on solid sorbents, not that different from how we use our catalytic converters in the automobile today. And so those approaches can use low grade heat, like 80, all the way down to 80 degrees C up to 120 degrees C, so a broad range. And so that geothermal is a really interesting opportunity to couple with some of these plants on when, when the plants are say on the order of thousands uh, of scales of CO2 removal. The issue though is, is that geothermal doesn't often align well with the same kinds of rocks that store the oil and gas or which will ultimately store CO2. And so you have to think about how to get it from point A to point B. And so in our work, we found that on scales of say less than 500,000 tons of CO2 um, produced or removed from the atmosphere every year, that trucking is actually economic. We all just go to this option of pipeline infrastructure and not everybody wants these pipelines in their backyard either. Um, but it turns out that we do know how to, there are gas companies that move CO2 around today. There are Air Liquide is one of them. There's a number of these, you know, uh, where they have the infrastructure and the fleets to do this. And so I think, you know, engaging in those communities um, to be thinking about, you know, that type of, Opportunity is important when it's on a smaller scale, but still the scale we need is a stepping stone. Uh, then we don't have to really go straight away to thinking about pipeline infrastructure. And so that's important. Um, the other piece I would say in terms of siting, it does go back to this. It's like, you know, the availability of low carbon energy, uh, the availability of what to do with the CO2 in a culture and a community that's okay with putting it in the ground. If they're not okay with putting it under their feet, there are other options. You know, maybe there's an opportunity for back to the circular economy concept. Are you nearby a refinery where you could imagine that the refinery is repurposed? You know, in the, it, there are plenty of refineries today that have actually been doing Fisher trope catalysis for decades. And that's exactly the chemistry that we need to turn CO2 and green hydrogen into chemicals and, and fuels. And so that's an opportunity. 
Um, another opportunity is if you're around, you know, we just had a recent story that appeared um, where we're looking at reacting CO2 with asbestos. So abandoned asbestos mines. Those materials, the tailings associated with those mines are really reactive to CO2. So you're actually disposing two wastes, asbestos and CO2 through mineralization. And so looking at the local geology and appreciating the potential for alkalinity reactions with CO2, it doesn't all have to be associated with sedimentary basin storage. It just happens to be because in the United States, we've been doing that since 1972. And that's what we turn to first, but we don't have to. Thank you, Jen. Uh, I want to uh, switch gears a little bit. We have a question uh, about environmental justice and kind of global participation in the governance of direct air capture. So uh, Simon, for instance, in your presentation, you mentioned environmental justice, and we know that uh, often countries uh, that are on the front lines of climate impacts today are often least responsible for kind of historical CO2 emissions. Uh, with that in mind, uh, What's the role for developing countries uh, with low historical responsibility uh, for in the uh, governance of the process around direct air capture, the full governance process you spoke about in your presentation? Uh, what, what would you see as the, the role for many of these countries? Uh, well, the, the, the short dodge answer is to ask people from the Global South that question. And one, one of the things I really appreciate about the way you do your work, Michael, and, and the way the C2G operates is that instead of having people from the North speak for the South, which happens just way too often in climate conversations and particularly around these sorts of options, which look technological, um, we need to have voices from the South telling us what the perspective from their communities is, right? Um, I could imagine that there might be people um, in, in countries in the, in, the, in the global south who would say, we don't want these operations dumped on us as the north tries to sidestep the need to abate emissions. You know, don't, don't make us clean up the mess. I could also see um, people in the south saying, uh, we need this stuff potentially because nothing else is working and let's get to work together um, on seeing what's here. Um, and there could be exciting economic and other opportunities to explore. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and so broadening the conversation now um, and making sure people can speak for themselves in this conversation in a meaningful fashion is like step one in getting environmental justice considerations baked into carbon removal. Jen, any follow-up thoughts there? I mean, I would just say that we we need more data. Again, I, I'm from a more of like an engineering perspective and also mm -hmm. thinking about how do we actually get projects going on the ground. And I think it's important to understand what are the resources that are available? What are the potentials uh, for, for agricultural biomass waste availability in various regions? Um, do we have characterization of sedimentary basin storage in all of the, these regions? Do we have alkalinity maps of what types of rocks, what kind of mining activities are taking place and what are the wastes associated with those? Um, so I, I, I feel like we need a lot more data to be able to understand what the opportunities might be and it could lead to really exciting things like, like jobs, you know, like is there a way to be able to, um, you know, just like in the state of California, they have the low carbon fuel standard. Well, they're willing to pay $200 to anybody who can take the, a ton of CO2 out of the air through direct air capture and permanently remove it to offset their transportation sector. So it's like, we could do something like that too. You know, uh, if, if we're wanting to be responsible for reduce, reducing our emissions, why does it need to, why does the dedicated storage have to happen in the United States? It doesn't. So maybe we could pay to have it happen elsewhere if we understood the opportunities better. We have uh, five minutes left. I want to cover two questions. One, a very specific technical question, Jen, which I'll direct at you, and one, a broader question, which I'll direct at both of you. Um, the technical question uh, comes from Toby. Uh, he asks, can you outline specific pros and cons of liquid solvent versus solid sorbent? Um, which use cases are best suited to each technology? And also, do you see promise in the Electra Swing or other emerging techs, some of which you touched on before, but maybe you can um, answer that. All three approaches are best <laughs> because the answer is we need everything, you know, um, and there isn't one winner over another. 
I think we, again, it, it comes down to, it, it, it's not an easy solution or else we would have done it already. And so you have to start, I think, on the ground where you're asking yourself, what are my energy resources available? Uh, and and where, where am I gonna put the CO2? And the reason why that's important is because where you're gonna put the CO2 means like how much can I inject in terms of CO2 per year? And how much I can inject is gonna dictate how much I'm gonna remove from the atmosphere. Those two things need to match up. And the technologies are, are really different today. So like the solid sorbent based modular approach is on the order of thousands of tons per unit removal per year. The solvent based approach is on the order of a million tons of CO2. I mean, these are very, very different approaches. You can make the solvents on a large scale. The, the um, process itself is dictated by large pieces of equipment. Um, you know, where the other one again is modular. So then it also, it's not that one is better than the other, but that they each require different inputs and they're each going to have a place in the portfolio of solutions differently, regionally different. And I'll add that not one is a winner, but you could also look in, you could look at, you know, I, I say a million tons of CO2 per year. Somebody might say, well, wow, that's huge. That's the winner right there every plant they build, they remove a million tons, like that's great. And then somebody says, oh, but Climeworks, you know, it's only a thousand tons. We're like, what good is that? But here's the difference is that the Climeworks is modular, which means that every, it's like your cell phone and your computer and we know how the costs have come down for those. It's like the photovoltaics, right? By the way, which mostly was had to do with uh, subsidies and policies with a drop in price, not technology. But, but the thing is, is like every time you build one of those smaller units, you have an opportunity to learn. And so every time you learn, you have the opportunity to bring costs down. And so you are going to move faster down that cost curve. So I anticipate that technology coming down faster in costs. But the other one, it's like, yeah, it takes longer to build. It takes longer to raise the capital. But boy, every time you build one of those plants, the impact is significant. And so both are just very unique. The third one, electro swing or electrochemical, and the two are different, but I'm not going to go through the distinction here, um, is like, that's... I, I find that to be exciting because right now it's like these other ones are thermally dominated. So 80% of the energy, 80% is thermal and there's lots of ways to make heat. So don't, you know, you don't need to get nervous about, you know, oh, it's competing with all of the other energy resources. But electro swing is different, right? Because it means that you could couple to renewable energy directly. You can turn it off and on, you know? So, there, so if it's intermittent, electricity, it's okay. You know, very different than thermal, where it's like, you don't want to turn those units up, you know, off and on necessarily. You lose a lot of efficiency by doing that. So, so there's, there's exciting things associated with each of the sectors. That's why I say there, there's, everybody's always asking me if there's a winner. There is no winner. We need, we need all of these approaches. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, just w final question. We've got one minute. We're going to run over just a couple here. Uh, if, if I can ask your both of you to stick with us just a few extra minutes. Um, Simon, in your presentation, you laid out the idea of thinking about direct air capture with carbon storage as a public good, um, something that should be done in the public interests. Can you help us think through, you know, we've discussed a couple of potential regulatory or policy pathways uh, that can help direct direct air capture in that direction. But what about narrative pathways that might make that possible? How should people be talking about direct air capture uh, to head in that direction, do you think? <clears throat> uh, well, I mean, the, the good example that we have at the moment is the vaccine that's required in the face of COVID, right? Um, we need uh, massive public investment at the same time as we have corporations working for breakthroughs and innovation, ultimately to do something which is all, is an all of our benefit. But um, I, I think we have to say the same sort of thing about carbon removal. We need massive public investment to incentivize corporations to work on the breakthroughs to do something that we all need. Jen, do you have some thoughts here? Uh, well, we've heard that, you know, in the last year, over a hundred corporates have made pledges, right? Mm -hmm. um, carbon neutral, in some cases like Microsoft, uh, even you know removing carbon in order to deal with legacy emissions. And so I, I think it's exciting space right now that these corporates are willing to lean in and maybe pay more early uh, so that later 
uh, everybody can afford it, you know, because that's ultimately what we need. Uh, we, we, you know, it's only, it's, it's, it's rough when only like a few people can actually afford it because they want to make that sustainable choice, right? And so the idea is, is that if we can invest now and maybe have the proper governance, the proper policy put in place to try and close the economic gap so that everybody, all of the corporations can be, can afford these approaches. I'm going to cheat here a bit. It's been pointed out to me. We have one more question we should address quickly from Ted, uh, who works on thermal approaches to direct air capture, uh, but he says he has few colleagues with needed expertise at his university. Is there a meeting or mechanism for him to find the appropriate physics and engineering expertise? So someone asking about their professional development in this, um, do you, either of you or both of you have some advice? There's a community now called Air Myers, and uh, they have a number of seminars, but also just a network that could be good for folks that are interested in learning more, but also collaborating with different groups to maybe engage into that network. I would, I would encourage uh, that person to do that and others who are interested in this space. Okay. Fantastic. Well, uh, listen, thank you both. Uh, for joining us today, for putting together these fantastic presentations, and then for being with us for this Q&A. Um, and we hope for the audience that this event was useful uh, to understanding basic concepts around direct air capture and dig into some of the thinking. Uh, for more information on upcoming online events with C2G, you can visit our website, uh, c2g2.net, c2g2.net. Um, and you can help us improve the quality of these events by filling out a survey that'll pop up on your screen once the webinar is over. Uh, I want to thank Simon and Jen again for being with us today and sharing their insights. And thanks to my colleagues behind the scenes for making sure that this event ran smoothly, uh, uh, specifically Aliyah Hassan for managing the question flow uh, in this event. And with that, thank you. See you again.